Dear family and friends in Christ Jesus, may the rich grace of Christ dwell with you every day. May you know him as your good shepherd who leads and guides you every day. Please join me in prayer. Holy Father, we give thanks to you for blessing us with opportunity to worship in your name this day, to come together in your word, to celebrate your son, our good shepherd. Help us each day to follow in his paths. Help us each day to, to lead those paths of righteousness, knowing that we cannot do so alone, but only by the power of your Holy Spirit living within us. Lead us always to follow you, that we, even in suffering, may know that you per even now prepare a place that we might spend eternity with you. In all things we pray through Jesus Christ, our good shepherd's holy name. Amen. For just a moment this morning, I'd like you to think. I want you to think back for just a minute of a person in your life who has had a dramatic impact on your life. It could be a mother, it could be a father, it could be an uncle or an aunt. I want you to think about a person who has shaped and formed you, the way that you make decisions now. You can point back and say, oh, I remember mom used to do it that way. Dad used to do it that way. Maybe it was someone who was a teacher, a pastor or a priest, someone who has left a lasting impact on you. And I want you to think about that impact that they left on you. And why did they leave that impact? What was it about them that they left that impact on you, etched that permanent mark on you, that even to this day you see echoes of them? I know for me, it's, even though I know it's Mother's Day, it was my father. And my father still, in some ways, I, I, I can see my, myself, or see him in myself. I, you understand what I'm saying there. I see uh, just the way that I do things. I, I, I'm very reminiscent of the way my dad does things. I remember when I was little, this is one way I'm not like him, but when I was little, I literally walked in his footsteps. We lived in a little house on Ray Street in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and there we didn't have a backyard, but we had this big front yard, and I remember it being fenced in, and I remember during the summer we could pick strawberries, but I remember every day, not every day, but when my dad would come home from work, he would mow the lawn. That's something my dad loves to do. He'd get out his old Sears mower, and he'd push it around the yard, and it didn't matter, he would still be in his tie, because back then people wore ties to work, and he'd push it around. And I would get out my little Fisher-Price bubble mower, and I would follow him around the yard. Now, Lord knows that it never actually put any bubbles out, but I would follow in his footsteps. Now, truth be told, Jacob, although he has a Fisher-Price mower, will probably never be following in those footsteps. I, unlike my father, do not enjoy mowing the lawn. It's not my favorite task. In fact, if you go by our house now, you'll see that it needs it. Hint, hint. But that being said, my parents did have, both my parents, not just my father, a dramatic impact on my life in the sense that they made faith important, in the sense that they made faith more than just religion, more than just something we did on Sunday morning. Faith was part of our daily walk with God. When we went home in the afternoons, when we, went, when we joined around the table, we would say prayers over our meals. When we went to bed at night, my parents would pray with us. But not only that, but they would read devotions to us. They didn't just talk about being Christian people. They lived it. And to this day, that has an impact in my life. It's an impact that I'd like to leave on Jacob as well. Something that I would like to pass on as that has been impressed upon me. And as we think about those who have left impressions on our lives, it also reminds us that there are people who look up to us. There are people in our lives who look at our example. They look at the way that we live. It doesn't just have to be your children or your grandchildren. It can be people who see you here at church. It can be people maybe that you've taught at school. It can be people that maybe their nieces and nephews that you only see three times a year. But the Lord has put us in a place that we can set an example. We can leave a lasting impression on the lives of the next generation. And so as you think about that, what impression are you leaving? When you talk about faith, is it strictly a Sunday morning thing? Or is there something more to it than that? When you talk about your walk with God, what is more important, the golf game, work at home, or the time that you spend in God's word, in prayer. 
God is very specific. He, he is very strongly throughout Scripture encourages us to set this good example. To not just talk about our faith, but to teach our faith. To pass on our faith. To show others our faith. As parents, as grandparents, as aunts, as uncles, as teachers and, and counselors, to pass on that good word. In fact, if we go back to Deuteronomy, back to the first five books of the Bible, in Deuteronomy, we have this text that is so important to the Jewish people that when it's read, they literally shudder and shake. But as we hear it, it reminds us of who God is meant to be in our lives and who he is meant to be as we teach him to our children. Just listen to these words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and, and when you rise. You shall bind them as signs on your hand and, they'll sh and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Word of God is meant to be talked about continually. The message of, of salvation is meant to be always on our minds. It's meant to be in the forefront. It is meant to be part of what we teach to our children and grandchildren every day. It isn't just meant to be something that is reserved for convenience and comfort. Paul echoes these very same words in Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Here again, we hear that encouragement that we, as the adults, we as the predecessors, we are meant to leave a lasting impact on the next generation. Now, by the way, even though Paul uses the word fathers there, moms, you're not out of this, by the way. Because the word that's used, it, much like in Spanish, you know, sometimes in Spanish they'll use uh, plural masculine to describe masculine and feminine. That's exactly what Paul's doing here. So really he's saying fathers and mothers. Set that good example. Discipline your children. Encourage them. So again, I ask you, what example are you leaving for the next generation? What impact are you having on the children that are in your life? Do they know Christ when they see you? Sometimes it's easier for us, even as the people of God, to succumb to the world, to give in to what is easier, what is more comfortable, to say that, well, we don't know exactly what we should do. But actually, Peter, in our epistle for this morning, he gives us a very specific command as to how we're supposed to live. I encourage you to turn there now and, and look at 1 Peter chapter 2 with me. But he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Paul's words are not exactly comfortable. They're not exa Peter's words are not exactly comfortable because as we hear them, we're reminded of how often our example is imperfect. He starts out, be without sin just as Christ is without sin. Have your children ever seen you sin? Your grandchildren ever, you know, did you ever get angry at them? Even though you knew it was just your frustration, your irritation. Have there ever been times where the example that you set, what people saw of you, was not that which you would want your fellow Christians here in church this Sunday to see? Maybe irritation at a driver that you were driving with, yelling at a family member who you couldn't get along with, being hurt and taking it out on your children or grandchildren. It's not easy 
to live up to what Peter has written here. To live up to that example of Christ. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it is impossible for us to live up to that example. It is impossible for us, even though we have the perfect example in Christ Jesus, our Good Shepherd, to live up to His example. It is impossible for us to live that life of perfection that we've been commanded to live. And yet it's not an excuse. It would be easier for us if we could at least say, well, that's our excuse. We, we can't live perfectly, so why try? But that's not what Peter says here, is it? He doesn't say, let this be your excuse. No. The truth is the only way that we can follow that example of Christ, even seek to follow that example for our, the next generation, set that example, is with the work of the Holy Spirit leading us to return to the cross of Christ. Leading us to go to that cross where we see that by His wounds we are healed. Those last words that Peter spoke are so powerful for us as the people of God. By His wounds, we are healed. By His suffering, by His death, by His perfect example, our sins are paid for. Although our examples are imperfect, although we are sinful people who fail time and again, Jesus does not fail. He never fails. And as our Good Shepherd, He goes and He takes our place. But He did not stay dead. He did not stay wounded, but He rose. He rose from the grave and conquered death once and for all. He rose from the grave, setting us that perfect promise, not just an example, but the promise that we would be with Him forever. The promise that as we will die one day, that we shall also rise. And as you think about what you teach the next generation, the example you set, more important than anything else, is that they know this truth of first importance. That they know what Jesus has done for them. That it is not by their power, that it is not by their, their, the, the time that they give, by, the, by their concentration, by their, by their words alone, but it is by what Jesus has done for them. The confession of faith that we have comes to us because of Jesus, our good shepherd, taking our place and making us whole, restoring us fully. And in that way, on that cross, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Not just I am the door, but I am the resurrection and the life. Not only does he become the way of salvation, but he is salvation. And that is the words we impart to the next generation. That is the example we set for them. That is the hope that we leave for them. The hope that they have a good shepherd who has been, become the way for them. But he does not just merely leave us here on the earth on our own. He does not merely lead us, leave us here to fend for ourselves among the wolves, the thieves, and the robbers. But as our good shepherd, he walks with us every day. As our good shepherd, he stands beside us and he picks us up when we have fallen down. And he prepares for us a banquet even in the presence of our enemies. That's, a, that's partially an allusion to heaven, but I also want you to see that another way too. Because as we come to the altar today, as we receive the Lord's Supper, that is also a banquet that our Lord has prepared for us to strengthen our faith, to carry us through each day. So as often as we come together and eat of his body and drink of his blood, we do proclaim that truth of our salvation, that promise that we have. So what impact will you have? What will you leave with your children, your grandchildren, with the next generation? I pray that you leave them with the truth that your parents gave to you, the promise that Jesus Christ, that he paid it all, that by his wounds you are healed, that by his resurrection you shall rise. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please pray with me.
Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for setting the perfect example for us through your precious sufferings and death. We pray that each day that we might see this example, that we might follow this example and know that as often as we fail, that you forgive us. Send your Holy Spirit that he might be our leader and our guide. May we know you, our good shepherd, that you lead us in paths of righteousness. Strengthen us each day that we might leave a lasting impact, that we might leave a lasting impression, that the next generation too may know that you are Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.